Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. I'm because Dave, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. All right. Good morning, church. You know, I'm going to ask, my wife said you should practice, how many came expecting today? All right, most of the front. All right, great deal. Always tell by where you're sitting whether you're here to hear something or not. So today I'm here to tell you, I believe, oh. did, I, did I say something wrong? Okay, good. Woo! <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in my notes yet, so that's usually when I make a mistake, you know what I mean? Say something stupid, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, I have to share you a word I, I believe that's for today. And I'm excited to, se- to share it with you. But in order to share it with you, you're going to have to give me an extra 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. I just didn't want to do two parts on this one, so I thought, well, we'll just shove it in. And since this is the second service, I really don't have to put a rush on it like I did the first service. So, you know, I could probably, I might take up 10 extra minutes, so. If you'll give that to me, I'll be okay. All right, so I've told you the story before, that back before COVID hit, back in 2019, that uh, there was stuff going on. And I had so much stuff going on that uh, I couldn't hear God on my own. You know, we get to that point sometimes, and so we just can't hear God's voice because we're too consumed with our own nonsense going on. And so I, I told Pastor Steve, I'm taking a Sunday off, and uh, I'm going to go and see if God can speak to me. So I, I went to my friend Steve Reyes' church, and it's known, it's known for this kind of crazy stuff, and kind of like ours. And so I get to the door of his church. Nobody there knows me. I've never been there. And uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but if you don't know me, I'm kind of intimidating. And so, you know, it, you know just, just to put that out there, you know, and I'm dressed in my bright pink shirt just to make it worse, you know what I mean? And, uh, was it, yeah. was it, oh, it was our anniversary. So we go to church on our anniversary, and I preached on our anniversary too this year. But anyway, so, ooh, that was like three years ago, four years ago, whatever. I don't know how it to be, but anyway. So I go in there, and I'm like, Lord, you need to speak to me today. And I figure that the Word is going to speak to me, because that's usually how God speaks to us, through the Word of God. And so I'm, I'm waiting for the Word to come along, and I'm in the middle of worship, got my hands up. And in the middle of worship, this young lady, pretty small, they still don't know who she is, because they have people who do that kind of stuff in their church, but this wasn't one of them. And because uh, they're much older, the two that they had, and this was a young lady. And she came up, and she tugged on my shirt, and got me out of worship, and said, you know, I believe God just gave me a word for you. Can I give it to you? And I said, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what I'm here for, right? And she, she looked at me with a look in her face. She said, God said to tell you he's about to shake the whole earth. He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, and it's going to affect your entire life. And she walked away. So my first thought was, Lord, I hope I'm not the chaff. The next Sunday, we no longer had church anymore. The COVID had happened, and they shut down our churches. And so for the next year, I believe God talked to a multitude of us because we, we really didn't know what to do under that, that situation. God had literally shook the earth. He shut everything down everywhere. And here we are, a church, not knowing whether we should be open, whether we should be closed, what should we do. We're all seeking God's opinion, and he's not giving it to us, and, and we're, we're not knowing what to do, and and, you know, and I believe he took that time to separate us. We still had church, but we didn't have church. You know, we were still preaching on Sundays, but we didn't have church. We didn't have all the stuff that goes along with being a pastor of a church. It kind of slowed things down for us so where we could consult with God on what was going on. And in the middle of that time, God, God showed me some things. And in that time, he told me, you know, how we open our churches will determine whether we remain a church or not in the time to come when we got out of COVID. That's the reason why we brought the Holy Ghost back into the church. And then he told me that there would be a great awakening. There'd be a harvest of souls. And so I've been telling you for the last couple of years, there'll be a harvest of souls larger than the world has ever seen before. And so we've been going message after message. You know, we're, we're, we're not that smart to prepare that far ahead. We're both in our upper years, so we're like pretty much week by week. You know what I'm saying? 
And so we have just been going by the guidance of the Holy Ghost, and things have just been falling in place. And I believe the whole time I'm asking God, how is this going to happen? And I believe he's revealed it to me, and I'd like to share it with you. I believe God has a fourfold agenda. It's actually five, but I don't have the in, the in, in time resurrection part down yet. I'll give that to you at another date. I can prove four of them. He has an end time agenda for the times that we live in. How many of you want to believe that we were, could be in the end times? Okay. The end of the end times. You know, We've been in the end times since the day of Pentecost, but I believe that we're in the end of the end times that Paul talks about. And so... Um, I'll give those to you. Number one, end time shaking. Shaking always has to deal with judgment. God shook the earth. I believe he judged the church at that moment because he shut us down to give us time to hear from him and to do what it is he's called us to do and to be what he's called the church to be. He shook the whole earth in order to get our attention. There was an end time shaking. Then there's an end time awakening. Those who realize that God had spoke to them and said, this is what you need to do. There are many Assembly of God churches that were, we were, we were two years ahead of them, by the way, that came to a point, we went to a big meeting, and they decided as Assembly of God church that we should bring the Holy Ghost back in the church. I looked over and pastor and go, we're about two years ahead of them, <laughs> right? And so the churches began to bring the Holy Ghost. We're talking Assembly of God Pentecostal churches. We are born, that we are Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled churches. They decided to bring their, the Holy Ghost back into their church. And the other day we were talking to Brother, what's his name? Yeah. Kathy? He's our district. Brett Allen. Brett Allen. Thank you. We're talking to Brother Brett, and he's like, churches all over are exploding. He goes, I go into churches all the time. Because why? They decided to bring the Holy Ghost back into their church. And if you look around, I'm just going to say, if you look at the church that are struggling to come back after COVID, it's because they took a stance where they're still pushing the Holy Ghost out of their church. They're still afraid of somebody speaking in tongues or making a scene or being noisy. You know what I mean? They just kind of like pushed him right out. There's an awakening taking place. And with the judgment, the judgment is not only for us Christians, it's for those who have been far away. You notice the church, there's people here today that have been far away. They've been far off. And God has spoken to them and said, you need to go to church. You need to start coming back to church. We have eight to ten people new every Sunday here, this church, because God has told them or drew them here. Nobody encouraged you. God drew you. If you're here today, it's not by happen chance. God drew you here today to hear this message because he wants to change your life. And so there's an awakening. And we're beginning to see the versions of what's coming as an end-time harvest of souls coming in, the largest harvest of souls we've ever seen. I just want to say that, you know, I've, uh, we went through, i got three Bibles here today left, so there's three of you today that need to get born again. you got your name on it. I want you in at the end of this service. I know it's the devil's going to try to keep you down, but you come forward, you say a prayer. Our altar workers are going to hand you a Bible. You're going to sign up on a baptism list, and two weeks from now you're going to get baptized, and your life will never be the same again. I can promise it. We're in those days. The reason why I know there's three, because I was going to go get more Bibles between services, and the Holy Ghost said, no, you're okay for today. We'll just give away those three. So I decided to paraphrase. We're going to skip shaking, awakening, and harvest, because I've already kind of explained that to you. I got, I got scriptures for it all. I got Isaiah 17, Isaiah 54. I got all the scriptures to back everything I set up that he talks about. But if I, if I did that, it would take a whole service, and it would be very wordy. Wordy is a nice way of saying boring. <laughs> so we're just going to go to the end, to the end time glory. Is that okay with you? We're just going to talk about how he's going to get that done. Do you believe this is all going to take place? Yes. We're going to talk about how he's going to get that done. So the first thing we must do is ask, what is Glory. What is glory? You hear it in the church. Glory, glory. Show us your glory. Where's your glory? Glory, glory, hallelujah. We, wh what is glory? Glory is the manifest presence of God. It is everything that he is and everything that he was. In the Old Testament, the glory was first seen in the garden. 
as God walked around and showed his manifest presence in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. With the children of Israel, the glory of God was tangible presence of God. They could see it. They could touch it. They could probably smell it. It was a tangible presence that set upon the Ark of the Covenant as they walked through the wilderness. It became a fire by night and a cloud by day. It became the fire on the mountain with the smoke and the thunder and the lightning. The Bible says that when they walked, the glory would go out from the Ark of the Covenant and go out in front of them. You need to listen, church. It would go out in front of them. It would make crooked places straight. It would eat up the lions and the dangerous animals that were there to get them. Everything that was in a danger to the children of God on their path, on their journey to their promise. Are you, are you hearing me, church? If you've been here for a while, you know we're still going down that path to the promise. The glory of the Lord would go before them and consume it. Everywhere the glory of the Lord manifested. Every need was supplied. When the glory of God was in the camp, nobody's shoes wore out. Nobody went hungry. Every morning they would get up and have steak and eggs or biscuits and gravy. The Bible says they would get out of their tent and on the ground would be manna. Manna means what is it? That's what manna is. What is it? Well, I don't know. What do you want this morning? Steak and eggs, biscuits, gravy, sausage and potatoes. That's what you got. Eat it. That's what it's going to taste like. Whatever your heart desire needs right now, it's called manna. What is it? That's, what it? that's what the word manna means. You want to know how they ate it every day? Because they tasted different every time they ate it. There was no lack when the glory of God was there. Because Jehovah Jireh, the provider, was in their midst. Wherever the glory was, sick bodies were healed. You need to listen, church. The Bible says there was not one sick or feeble amongst them. Not one sick or feeble amongst them, wherever the glory was. Deliverance would happen. Wherever the glory was, walls would fall down like at Jericho. Wherever the glory was, his presence would just step in the midst. It would confuse the enemy. They would just turn on each other. <laughs> I think that's a warning. If they're in the midst, I confuse the enemy, and they would just turn on each other. We're about to see an awakening. Wherever the glory was, I'm telling you right now, you're going to see it in the world's atmosphere. They're going to start turning on one another. Wherever the glory was. The glory, the manifest presence of God should be on my PowerPoint. Let's say that out loud. The manifest presence of God. That's what we're contending for here. That's what we want to experience here. That's why we're here today. So if it was important to the children of Israel, the manifest presence of God, shouldn't it be important to us today? I teach you for a moment. It's going to get exciting. I hope you're a little more awake than the first service. Okay, the Hebrew word, because you know how I am about words. For glory, this is Old Testament, because it's in Hebrew. Hebrew for the old, Greek for the new. Okay, write that down so you remember that. So in the Old Testament, the word for glory was kavod. K-A-V-O-D. Like many Hebrew words, glory in Hebrew holds more than just one meaning. Kavod is a term with social and moral implications. It stems from the root word weight. W-E-I-G-H-T. Get it? That's heavy. <laughs> So it was said about the glory of God, it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. You ever notice when you're praising and all of a sudden that we call it, you know, the Holy Spirit in the room, 
What it is is God's presence manifests and we begin to feel it. We can feel it. It touches us. We, we know where something's going on. That's the manifest presence of God entering our, that's what we contend for, amen? amen. So I'm going to tell you something interesting about the glory. Everybody say glory. glory. Whenever the priest would pick up the Ark of the Covenant, it took four men, four priests. They were the only ones that could touch it. But this box was covered in solid gold. Now, you know gold is heavy, right? Gold is weighty. It is estimated that the box could have weighed more than 1,000 pounds. How many? How can four men carry 1,000 pounds all day through the desert heat on their shoulders? So the truth of the matter is, they didn't. I knew I'd get that one. Hang on. Because the ancient Hebrew writers and the rabbis used to talk about that whenever the priest would pick up the Ark of the Covenant and put it on their shoulders, all of a sudden the Ark would begin to hover. It would begin to hover. So listen to me here, church. Type in shadow. It would hover. It wasn't that the priest had to bear the weight of God's glory. It was just up to the priest to walk and carry the glory. I'm going to read that again for those that are slow in the back. It wasn't up to the priest to bear the weight of God's glory. It was just up to the priest to walk and carry the glory wherever the Holy Spirit told them to go. That's the reason Jesus comes along and says, there's something you need to know about my presence. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not up to you to carry the weight of God's presence. But it is up to you to simply say, I will be a facilitator of that presence. I will be a facilitator of that presence. I will go wherever he tells me to go. I will do whatever he tells me to do. I will say whatever he tells me to say. This is why I'm over your head, huh? You good? Because hang on, it gets better. It gets better. Maybe it's too wordy for you guys today. You're all thinking too hard. I'm going to tell you, when I was typing this message up, I had to get up four different times and go, I just can't write no more. I'm so excited. I just want to share that with somebody. That was so good right there. So there's another interesting thing about this word in Hebrew, kavod. It is connected to another meaning. You know, I told you it had multiple meanings. It's not just heavy. It also represents an armament. It's not just heavy. It also represents an armament. You're making it easy for me to stay calm here. You guys are staring way too hard. <laughs> we should have no problem getting to the last scripture here for sure today in this house. I'm way more excited than you. An armament. Do you get it? Yes. Other words... The heavy dimension of God's presence not only comes as a weight that sets on us, but it comes as a shield that destroys every single enemy that comes at us. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's more like it. Thank you. Yeah. But now when you get to the New Testament, the language changes. It turns to Greek. The word glory in the Greek is a word called doxa, D-O-X-A. It's where we get the word doxology. This word is actually used outside of Scripture to describe or refer to someone's reputation. This is an opinion or an estimation of someone. You're really going to have to stay with me here. In other words, the greater the person or object is, the greater its doxa. So to expound on their doxa, we create a doxology. So if I wanted to give you my, my approval or my opinion 
our estimation of Pastor Steve and his greatness, I would have to create a doxology. I would have to come out of the point and say, this is him. I would write it all down. Doxa. So in the New Testament, when we see the word glory, it's talking about opinion, estimation, or representation. For those writing, it's opinion, estimation, or re representation. So let's go over the process. There's been an end time shaking. God shut down the world and got the church's attention. We're in the middle of an end time awakening. God's showing people what we need to do. He's drawing people back to his house. We're at the cusp of an end time harvest where he's going to pour out his spirit on all men. How are we going to do this? End time glory. End time glory. How's it going to happen? I've been trying to figure this out for years, about three now. I want to know how God was going to do this. What's he going to do? What's going to happen? How are we going to have an end time harvest? How are people going to get excited? How is this revival that we've been in for three years? Everybody keeps praying for revival. We're in one. We're in one. It's just a little different than what you're used to. This one's going to last for a long time. It's not just going to be for a moment. How is this going to happen? Well, can I share? I think God's going to do it. Okay, two of you. <laughs> The rest of you are thinking about where you're going to go for lunch, huh? Well, I'm going to get your attention right now. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What, Pastor Chris? How is that going to cause an end-time harvest? I know you've got something crazy up your sleeve. For all, who's all? have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're going to read that out loud. Read it for me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to look at the scripture. I'm still teaching here. Remember the Greek word for glory is doxa. So this is going to blow your mind. You ready? Remember you gave me permission to ruin the way you read your Bible. So if we read that scripture according to the original text, it would say, for all have sinned and fall short of the opinion or the estimation of God. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe that's the one I should have put on the PowerPoint, huh? <laughs> for all have sinned and fall short of the opinion or the estimation of of God. So that being said, we're talking about the greatest sin in your life is not adultery. It's not addiction. It's not those kind of sins. For any believer, it's not lies, stealing. I'm not saying those are okay because they're still sin. But that's not the greatest sin in your life. The greatest sin in your life right now, what I believe in the church, we have taken these sins and made perverse things of them, but the one thing we have left out, when, we, when the reality, according to our Bible, sin is living beneath God's opinion or estimation of you. Yeah. That ought to speak to somebody in here. Sin is living beneath God's opinion or estimation of you. You're going to have to prove that to us, Pastor Chris. God has an opinion about you. And this opinion was created before the foundations of the earth. Oh, there he goes again. You guys ready? Got your spiritual eyes and ears open? Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasures of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Psalms 139.13 says, for, 
for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. Before you were ever in your mother's womb, God saw your substance. God already knew what you were qualified to do. If he would not have qualified you to do it, he would not have put you in time right now. You could have been born at any time. You could have been born in Jesus' days, walking in Birkenstocks and sand up to your ankles. But he created you for this time, the end time, the end of the end times, because he already qualified you and already knows you got what it takes to get through this thing. In other words, there's something on the inside of you called the God gene. Ooh, Pastor Chris, you did not go there. That when God created you, he deposited himself in you. There are three characteristics about God that sets him apart from all the others, so-called gods or idols. One is omniscient. Omniscient. He knows everything. Nothing ever occurred to him. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. So watch what God does when he creates you. He forms your substance before you're in your mother's womb. He put a part of himself in you. Where do you get that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says we are created in his image and likeness. No, we're, we're not gods of our own, but we're like God. It says we're created in his image and likeness. You say, I'm not omnipotent. No, you don't have all power. I'll give you that. Watch what God does. He takes some of himself and gives it to you your substance, and he gives you your own potential. <laughs> Please tell me again that you ain't all powerful, but you have your own potential. You have potential because God created you with potential. You have potential because your potential comes from God. I hate to tell you this because you're going to get big-headed, you also have omniscience. You already know everything. That's true, Pastor Chris. <laughs> Every secret of the universe is already encoded on the inside of you. Oh, I see you don't believe it by your response. Scripture says in 1 John 2.20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. He says you have an anointing, from the Holy One, and you know all things. Say, I'm anointed. I already knew it was coming. So when God created you, he took some of his DNA. You need to get this. This is the purpose for regeneration. This is the purpose for being born again. This is simply more than just saying a prayer. This is regeneration, where all things pass away, all things become new. Regeneration. When you get born again, it is an awakening of the DNA that God put in you before the foundations of the earth. It is at that moment that God turns that gene on in your body. Before you were in your mother's room, he put it in there because he knew your substance. And God now has an estimation of you. His estimation is you're on this planet, or you're here on earth, to do certain things. He created you with a purpose, and with a purpose comes promise. His estimation is that this earth needs you more than you need this, this earth. His estimation is there's an anointing on your life. Say it again. Amen. That there is a glory on your life, that you are a vehicle for him on the earth. His estimation is you have dominion. He put all things under your feet. His estimation is you can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. 
His estimation is that you can prophesy. There's an anointing on you. Say, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Here's the problem. There's always a problem. When you look in the mirror, you're living up to your opinion of yourself. Maybe some of you are still living up to somebody else's opinion of you and not God's opinion of you. That was good, huh? I spoke to somebody right there. We're just going to throw this out here. So what we're saying here is when we pray, God, give us your glory. God, give us your glory. God is up there saying, I already have. It's in you. How about you show the world what I put in you before the foundations of the earth? Who would ask me for the glory and just show what I've already put in you before I ever created this thing? This is why I created you for this time and this day. That's why you're here now at this time in history. God's saying it's already in you before you ever got to this planet. So what if? What if? This great awakening that we're talking about, this thing that's going to change everything as we know it. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge, say knowledge, of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It doesn't say the earth will be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. It says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do you know that when you look that up, that the sea covers two-thirds of the earth? So what if the great awakening is it's two-thirds, because it does say he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. So there's going to be some of you in today that get this and some of you that don't. Just getting real. So what if this great awakening is two-thirds of his people come to the knowledge of his glory here on earth? If all of a sudden an awakening happens, hitting the body of Christ, about the opinion of God over their life, and all of a sudden they start believing his opinion of them. Sure is quiet in a Pentecostal church. You like in my wheat or in my chaff? Been there, done that myself. It's not, don't feel shame. Can I go on? You're pretty brave saying that over there. <laughs> so just as the glory was in the tabernacle in the Ark of the Covenant in the wilderness in the tabernacle in the children of Israel's time Paul comes along and says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God and you are not your own when I got born again, my life is no longer my business. I can firmly say that. I told God, my life is no longer my business. It's your business. Take me where you want to go. Do what you want to do. He says, because for you were bought at a price. Because I was worthless. And he bought me with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. There's a lot of truth in that scripture right there. The same thing that was in the wilderness, devouring its enemies, is the same thing healing the sick in the Old Testament. This thing is on the inside of you. This glory is on the inside of you. So now instead of saying, God, give us your glory, we should be saying, how do we release that which is on the inside of me? God, help me to release that glory that is on the inside of me. I see you still don't believe me. Got the same response from the last one. This must be too much for him. You're, you don't believe that you can carry this kind of weight, glory, W-E-I-G-H-T, with God. 
So if you're wanting the weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, God's up there in the weight, W-A-I-T, waiting for his church to come out of her slumber. Where's my alarm clock? ding a ling 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 <laughs> I'm telling you, church. I believe what's going to happen is God is going to awaken a sleeping giant that is on the earth. That we're going to wake up one day with a realization we're going to have the knowledge of his glory that dwells inside of us. Two-thirds, because he's separating the wheat from the chaff. I believe there's more power in us, more anointing in us, than we realize. Yes. It's on the inside of us already. I believe God's going to allow the shaking to shake, to separate the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the tares. And when he gets this done, when he's caused that separation, he's going to awaken the body of Christ. Those who have chosen their side. And there's going to be a harvest like we have never seen before. And the reason this is going to happen? Not because it's going to be a cloud that comes from heaven. Because there's going to become a glory that is released out of the church into the earth. When they realize that they can do what Jesus said they can do, and they could be what Jesus said they can be. I believe he said, greater works I do, you shall do. I believe he said, as I am, so are <laughs> in his glory. <laughs> as I am, so are you in his glory. <laughs> Don't get me started. All right, you ready? You want some more? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Careful where you fall asleep in church. So, how many of you want to know what this glory looks like? <laughs> Woo, look at that. We're excited today. So, all you got to do is open your Bible and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You want to know what the glory looks like? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's look at Jesus. You want to know what the glory looks like? Let's look at Jesus, the manifest presence of God in the flesh, the invisible image of a, a visible image of an invisible God. Jesus walks by dead people. What happens? They get up out of the grave. He walks by blind people. They get their sight. He goes by a lame man. He person stands up, starts dancing. You want to know what the glory looks like? You need a couple bucks. Go down and grab you a fish because there's a coin in its mouth. Good, people. If you want to know what the glory looks like, that's all got to do is look how Jesus lives. Because Scripture says in 1 John 4, 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Do you remember me telling you that the shaking represents judgment? So we may have boldness in the day of judgment. As the shaking is taking place right now, as we're standing in this time, where he's shaking his church, shaking the earth, shaking his people, that we can stand in boldness because as he is, so are we in this world in his glory. Yay! I can see some of you still don't believe. Gosh. Oh, it helps, huh? Okay, I'm going to have to give you one more scripture. I'm going to give you a story. How's that? Everybody shout glory. glory. This is God's end time agenda. Shaking. Awakening. Harvest. Glory. I'm going to give you a story out of the Old Testament. Ezekiel the prophet at the time of the first temple in the days of Solomon. The glory rises up. He sees the glory rise up out of the Holy of Holies. And it moves to the door of the temple. Can I remind you that Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun? 
till the, the, the glory moves from the Holy of Holies to the door of the temple. And nobody notices. Everybody's still doing their stuff. It goes out to the outer court and begins to hover on the outer court. That would be our parking lot. And nobody notices that the glory has left the building. They're still doing their stuff. They're still coming to church. They're still raising their hands. They're still clapping to the music. The priests are still doing their sacrifices. They're going through the motions. Sounds like the modern day church today. Doesn't it? The glory then lifts up. and The Bible says it hovers over the Mount of Olives and it stays there. You would think there would be somebody that would see the glory over the Mount of Olives from the temple and would be crying out for it. Bring back the glory. Bring back your presence. You think somebody would see it from a far distance and say, bring it back, Lord. But nobody notices. Nobody notices. You think somebody would see it. Well, Pastor Chris, how would they see it? Well, in the Old Testament writers described that the temple, there was a pillar of a cloud and fire that went up from the Holy of Holies. You could see it. You could see it. But nobody was looking. You could see it, but nobody was looking. There it is on the Mount of Olives. There it is. You can see it, but nobody's looking. Ezekiel says that he saw it ascend into heaven, and it's gone. The same glory that made Israel so great is now gone. And nobody notices. So what do they do? They build another temple. Let's build a bigger church. They build another temple, and guess what? God wasn't there. Do you understand? We can go ahead and build a big building, and God won't be there. Do you understand that we could fill that building full of Full of people doing religious things. Full doing religious things. And God not be there. Oh, what a miserable place that would be. Could you imagine what it's going to be like when we're raptured out of here and the presence of God leaves this earth? Oh, what a miserable place that will be. Pray that you count yourself worthy at that time. Before he comes, we will see that time. So the glory ascends and it's gone. Jesus looks down God and says, I didn't create them to live that way. I did not create my people to live void of the manifestation of the presence of God. The saints of old had let it let, let leave. So Jesus says, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap myself in flesh. I'm going to show them what it looks like, Pastor. I'm going to show them what God intended all along for man to carry the glory everywhere he goes. Jesus himself looks down and says, that's not how we created him to live. Absent of the manifest presence of God. I'll wrap myself in flesh. I'll go down there and show them. Church. What it looks like to walk in the glory everywhere we go. Jesus does this for about three and a half years. Finally, at the end of it, I want you to notice what happens. He first goes into the temple. And he turns over the money changers' tables. He 
He throws the tables over. He throws them out. Talks about his house as a house of prayer. And nobody listens. Nobody would listen. He goes from there out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he asked his disciples, can you please pray and stay awake? And they could not stay long enough to stay awake. He goes there. This Iophis court yard. This is where most of them fled. Only two go in, Peter and John. From there he goes to Golgotha where they crucified him. He dies. They put him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he resurrects from the grave. And watch what the glory does. He walks straight up to the Mount of Olives, the same place that Ezekiel saw the glory leave. Jesus, the glory, is now standing on the Mount of Olives where Ezekiel saw the glory leaves. It is now standing there, and he looks at 500 people. He says, I'm about ready to leave this place. But when the glory leaves, remember, it's not going to be gone long. Matter of fact, it's going to come back. You've got 10 days to get yourself to an upper room. And out of 500 people, only 120 a remnant decided to go hang out in that upper room. They all seen the glory ascend as Ezekiel did into heaven. He's like, peace, and off he ascended. But even though they saw it with their eyes, only 120, a remnant, went to the upper room. Jesus goes and sits at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that he makes his enemies his footstool. He turns to the third person of the Trinity, the person of the Holy Spirit, and says, now go. And on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the glory of the Lord. The Bible says that the cloud filled the sanctuary and tongues of fire landed on everybody's head. It'd be like in here. I'd be looking at yours, you'd be looking at mine, because if we went like that, it would just fly backwards. The Bible says that he filled the sanctuary, and the fire landed on every person's head that was in that room. That was in that room. Out of 500, only 120 stayed long enough to receive the gift. And the glory fills the people. That's Acts chapter 2. You get to chapter 3, people are getting healed. People are getting set free. You get to Acts chapter 4, people are getting delivered. Miracles are happening everywhere. What's the difference? Pay attention, church. What's the difference? The difference is now the glory is in a group of people. Not just in one man, not just in one building. It's in a group of people. It comes on whoever will open their heart and say, I want to be a carrier of the presence of Almighty God. It is available to any of us in this room today. It says, I will open my heart and I will be a carrier of the presence of Almighty God. So I read this so you don't think I'm crazy. We're going to wrap this all up. Then we're going to have an altar call. I'm going to get my altar team to come up. If you're here today and you did not hear what I just said, some of you are living like you're not up to God's opinion or estimation of yourself. Some of you are, I'm not bold enough, I'm not educated enough, I'm not whatever enough. The Bible says that whoever will open their heart and say, I will be a carrier of the presence of Almighty God. 
can receive. It's already in you. You don't have to ask for it. It's already in you. Ask him to release it. Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says, The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. I believe today is that day. That mystery has now been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known that their riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, that would be us, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Can I tell you today that the glory is not coming from the outside? The hope of glory is that you would look in the mirror and start having the same opinion about yourself as God has about you. That you would live up to the estimation that God has made about your life. Can I tell you, you look much better to God than you look to yourself. All of us at this point are living beneath the opinion and the estimation of God has for us. And that's the reason. The Bible says, for all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Of God. I believe today the greatest sin the church has is not living up to God's opinion of what he, is, he has about us. It is time for the church to become the church. Am I concerned about what's going on in the world right now? Yes. Yes. For us to know, we know. We know the time. We know what's going on. But I'm not as concerned about what's going on in the world now as I am concerned and worried about the church not realizing who we are in Jesus at this time. And what God has called us to do in this hour, and that we would realize in this moment of crisis there is danger and there is opportunity. There is danger and there is opportunity. This is our moment. This is our time. This is our moment. And every moment matters. Do you realize that the prophets of old looked to this day and wished they could live in it? The prophets of the Old Testament looked at the days upon which God has chosen you to live in and wish they could live in it. This is not the time to shrink back and be afraid. This is the time to stand up and be counted for the cause of Christ. This is our time. This is our moment. And from this point on, every moment matters. If you're here today and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I beg you today not to leave this place without coming up and allowing one of these altar workers to pray with you. Lead you in a simple prayer that will change your life forever. They're going to hand you that Bible. You're going to sign up on the baptism list and we're going to complete this thing. If you're here today and you're like, Pastor Chris, you're really speaking to me. I really am living under the opinion and estimation of what God has for me. I can feel it. I know he's called me. I know he has a purpose. I just don't know what it is. Then I would recommend that maybe you spend some time at the altar. God shows up to a prepared atmosphere. Maybe the altar fills up. That you at least would spend the time in your seat with your hands in the air as we worship, asking God to show you what it is, what's next, what do we do? If you're here today and you go, oh, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm broken. I just don't have the strength or the ability. The Bible says that wherever the presence of God is, there was not one sick or feeble. 
When do we, the church, start believing the Bible as the Bible? We have a job to do. We were created to live in this time upon which we lived in. That's why you're here. He would have created you some other time. You have a purpose and a plan for your life. We are about ready to see the largest harvest of people the world has ever seen. We're in the middle of a movement of God. And today is the day that separates from the next, what's coming up next. You need to get yourself right. You need to figure out what it is, God. You need to tell God to release the glory that is inside of you. And however you do that, that's between you and him. But please, get it done. Thank you for letting me preach.